and a happy new year uh, to all of you here today. Uh, today we begin at the season of Advent, and that is the new year for the church calendar. As we anticipate the coming of our Lord, as we consider his promises and his words of the Advent of Christ. Uh, we'll follow the order of worship, as uh, in part as you find it in the bulletin. And so I invite you to please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You may be seated as we sing our opening hymn, hymn 331, and we'll do verses 1 through 4. Hymn 331, verses 1 through 4. <laughs> sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness let us then confess our sins to God our Father most merciful God we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, 
and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading this day comes to us from the opening verses of the Bible from Genesis chapter 1. Begin reading with verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Here then also, reading from Hebrews chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, and many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand, of the majesty in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. And at this time, I'd like to especially address uh, the children that are with us here uh, this day. You know, sometimes people make promises to us, don't they? Maybe they promise that they will do something for us or that they'll give us something. But do people always keep their promises? Or do they sometimes break their promise to us? What do you think? Has anyone ever broken their promise to you? Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. Sure. I remember when I was in elementary school one time and I got, to, you know, got a reward for reading a, a lot of book reports. And, and one of the, the rewards I got were some nice pencils and on the outside, Instead of just being a plain yellow or something, they had all kinds of colors and designs, and they were really pretty nifty looking. I remember one of my classmates, he wanted some of those pencils, and, and he asked me if he could, he could have one or have some. And he made a promise to me. He said, you know, I'm going to get a whole bunch of these real soon, and I'll give, you, I'll give you some when I get those. Well, I trusted him. I gave him a pencil. But as you can well imagine, he never got any of those pencils. He certainly didn't give me any. He broke his word and his promise to me. Sometimes the word of people is broken. But you know what? Today God gives us his word. As we begin this season of Advent, God promises us his word promises us he will keep his word. And we have his word, of course, we have it in the Bible. We have all kinds of words from God here. Some have already come true. Some we're waiting still to be fulfilled. But today we're going to learn as we look at John chapter 1, the word was not only a promise God made, the word is Jesus. And God kept his promise in Jesus. Jesus came into this world. It's what Advent's about, the coming of God into our lives. He went to the cross, he suffered and he died for us and he rose for us. And he makes us a great promise that when we believe,
believe in Jesus, we will go to heaven. He will forgive us. We will go to heaven. And that is a promise we can always trust upon and rely upon because God has given us his word. He gives you his word. And even though people might break their word to you in this world, God will keep every word and every promise that he makes to you. Amen. And please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel this day then comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. This has also been the basis for our message this day. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We join together in confessing our Christian faith as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed, and that can be found in the inside back cover of your hymnal. We confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For the men who will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we'll sing our next hymn. And our next hymn today is hymn 540, Christ the Word of God incarnate. And we'll sing the first and the last verse. So the first and the last verse. It's easy to become skeptical when we hear those words. I mean, after all, people do not always keep their word. Promises are made, 
and broken. There are empty vows, pledges given and then forgotten, assurances given and then ignored. Words can be spoken with great fanfare. I'll always be there for you. I love you. We'll be BFFLs forever, best friends for life. You can count on me till death do us part. But sometimes words can be like the autumn leaves in October. They can quickly just blow away with the wind. That's why we become skeptical sometimes when we hear that phrase, you have my word. This Advent, we're going to work our way through a series on, in John chapter 1, looking at the first 18 verses. Each week, we'll look at a small section of that first chapter. And here in these verses, we have John's introduction to the gospel as he gives us many of the themes that he carries out throughout the gospel. But we also receive the lens through which we're able to understand the rest of the gospel. And if John's gospel is about anything, and if these opening verses are about anything, his gospel promise to you is, you have my word. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And then in verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. If, God, if John's gospel is about anything, it is about the Word of God. The Word made flesh, the Word of our Lord Jesus Christ, a Word that we can trust and rely upon, a Word that will be kept. John introduces some key themes of his gospel, and here are some of them. Jesus is the Word. God makes himself audible. He's not silent, but he speaks. He has ever since the beginning, and he continues to do so still to this day. Our Old Testament, our epistle, our gospel, all make that clear. Secondly, Jesus is the life. God makes himself tangible. He's not some vague, abstract idea or concept, he is tangible. Thirdly, Jesus is the light. He makes himself visible. He's not unseen, he's not hidden in the darkness. He is visible. He is the light. And fourthly, Jesus is the Son. God makes himself knowable. God is not some abstract idea, not some mystery that we need to figure out and solve, but God is knowable. And so what does all of this mean? It means that because of Jesus, we can hear and we can experience and we can see and we can know God. Today's focus is on Jesus is the Word. And first of all, the Word is connected to creation. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And those word, words mask so beautifully the opening verses of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John also further makes comparisons to that first chapter of Genesis as he uses themes like life and light and darkness, creation themes. It's kind of an interesting study to, to compare Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1. Again, to see how Jesus is the fulfillment of it all for us. Consider, for example, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. There in chapter 1, verse 3, God says, Let there be light. And there was light. And what an 
amazing thing. Your words can't do that. My words can't do that. But God's word has done that. God speaks and things happen. And God's word is connected to creation. In fact, it is God's word that created creation. Consider more verses that show us the power of God's Word. I always like this one, Joshua 21, verse 45. Not one word of all the good promises the Lord had made to Israel has failed. Not one. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Grass withers and flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever. Isaiah 55, 11, my word will not return to me empty. Again, it accomplishes something. It does something. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word brings clarity, doesn't it? And here's the point. God's word is truly the most powerful force in the world. God's word called Abraham out of Ur, the Chaldeans. God's word spoke to Moses through the burning bush. God's word fed the Israelites manna in the desert wilderness. God's word thundered through Mount Sinai as God gave his commandments. And God's word spoke in the still and quiet voice to Elijah. Why, God's word even made dry, dusty bones live. Just ask Ezekiel. Remember that chapter from Ezekiel, chapter 37? Ezekiel sees this valley full of dry bones, and then it all comes together into living beings. Beautiful picture of the resurrection. God's word, the most powerful force that exists. God speaks, and it happens. We can trust it, we can believe in it, we can rely upon it. In the beginning was the Word. And God brings His Word to you again this day and in this season of Advent. Furthermore, God's Word is connected to God. In fact, the Word was God, John 1.1 1, 1 tells us. Word of God is not just a combination of letters to form some sort of words on a page of paper. The Word is real. The Word is active. The Word is powerful. The Word is God. And Jesus is not just a junior partner in God's kingdom. He's not a vice president in the universe. He is 100% totally, truly, the Word of God. He is God. Eternal, almighty, and powerful. The Word is connected to God. In Exodus chapter 3, when, when God appeared to Moses, the burning bush, and, and called him on this mission that he was to go on, God said to, to Moses, I am who I am. And John, in order to reveal that Jesus truly is this same God, gives seven I am statements in his gospel. Maybe in another series we'll consider these. John 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 10, verse 7, I am the door. John 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John 15, 1, I am the true vine. The word is connected to God. The word is God. Jesus 
is God. And furthermore, the word is connected to us. John chapter 1, verse 4, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. God said in the beginning, let there be light, and there was light. The Word is connected to God. In fact, the Word is God. And now out of great love and His mercy toward us, this Word connects to us. And how does God do so? By light. You know, we learn to appreciate light from a very young age, don't we? When we're very young, we might become frightened of the dark. We want a night light. We start to envision monsters under the bed or in the closet or other such things. And even though there might not actually be monsters under the bed or in the closet, the reality is, is that from a very young age we begin to sense that there is something uneasy about darkness. As adults we learn to appreciate light as well. We don't like to stumble around in the darkness. You know, it amazes me. I can walk down the hall, and if the lights are off and it's dark, I can feel very uneasy. Maybe I'm nervous I'm going to trip over something or walk into something. Maybe I'm nervous, that fearful that somebody's going to jump out and attack me. All i got to do is flip the switch, and those fears go away, don't they? Light shows that there's nothing to worry about. And light even brings clarity. At night, if I wake up, oh, it's nice to have a clock that's lit up and I can quickly see what time it is. If that's not working and I try to look at my watch, well, it doesn't have a light. It's just a cheap watch. Light brings clarity. Light brings vision. Light brings peace and calm in our lives. Light is truly our friend. What are those dark places in your life where you need light to shine again? Oh, we know about those dark rooms, don't we? Those dark places. Fear, loneliness, grief and sorrow. Guilt and shame, sickness, and death. Oh, well, sometimes darkness can come into our rooms, and oh, it can be very dark. It can make us feel very uneasy and frightened. And then in our darkest times and moments, Satan, the accuser, shows up, and he points his finger at us, Accusing us and mocking our feeble discipleship, our failed relationships, our fatal attractions. Oh yes, how dark those rooms can become. But when we're in the dark, notice what God promises. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness is not understood, or another way to translate that, overcome it. But notice the verb shines. It's present tense. God didn't say it once shone or one day it will shine, but it shines. It's going on now and it continues to go on. Even in the midst of the darkness that we face, the light shines and darkness has not overcome or understood it. And this light and this darkness takes us to that day on Good Friday. And oh, what a dark day it was. Blood, sweat, tears, fear and anxiety, death, darkness for three hours, a dark tomb, Oh, how deep that darkness was as the disciples fled and scattered in fear and uncertainty. But then on the third day, the light began to shine again out of the tomb. 
Death could not prevent the light from shining. And this light would overcome the darkness. And why is that? Because this light is God's Word. And we have God's Word. You have God's Word. Consider some of these words that God gives to you. John 14, verse 2. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Or John 16, 33. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Press into God's word. Press hard. Find those treasures there in the word that really lighten up those dark rooms in your life. And when fear comes, say, but God said. And what did God say? Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. When doubts arrive, say, but God said. And what did God say? 2 Timothy 2.13 if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. When the darkness of temptation is there in your room, say what God said. And what did God say? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. When guilt overwhelms you, say, but God said. And what did God say? 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sin, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we encounter a world filled with chaos and trouble and discord, say, but God said. And what did God say? John 16, 33. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Oh yes, the light overcomes the darkness. When there's confusion and uncertainty, remind yourself of what God said and John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It is through faith that we are saved. It is through faith that we cling to God's word and his promise. That word that brings light, assurance, and clarity and peace to us. You can trust that word. You can rely upon that word. You can memorize that word and remind yourself regularly. But God said. Maybe you can think of a time in your life where someone gave you their word and it helped you. Maybe it brought you a peace and assurance. You know, when I was growing up, I, I knew I could trust the word of my parents especially my dad. If he made a promise, I knew he would be faithful and he would carry that promise out. I didn't have to worry about it. If he gave some sort of assurance, I knew I could trust him and I didn't have to worry either. I also learned that if he threatened something, I better pay attention to that as well. God has given to us his word. Trust it. We can rely upon it. He will be faithful to it. 
God gave his word, and through the centuries, people were waiting for the fulfillment of that word, for the first advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, as we look back, we know that God has fulfilled that word of promise, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. As we mark the beginning of this season of Advent, our attention again is on God's words of promise. And we can treasure that word. It is a word that is connected to creation. It is a word that is God. And it is a word that connects to us. And sometimes the darkness in our lives is like a very dark room. And we feel anxious, fearful, or unclear. Well, God gives his word, he gives light, and it shines in the darkness. And so we can slow down, we can take a deep breath, we can trust God and his word, we can trust the word made flesh. And what is this word God gives to us? What is his name? We know his name. It is Jesus. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. At this time, then, we present ourselves and our offerings to the Lord. Please rise. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. We pray to the Lord, and we'll use the prayers as you find them printed. Heavenly Father, hear us as we praise you for the beauty and power of your word. Not one word of all the good promises the Lord has made has failed. Your word is trustworthy and true. Grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Your word endures forever. My word will not return to me empty. Your word works, always doing what it says. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word shines in the darkness, and the darkness will never overcome it. And Heavenly Lord, as we live in a sinful world, we know that we cannot always trust the word that others give to us. In fact, we've even learned that we cannot always trust our own words and promises. But Lord, you are faithful, and you keep every word that you have given to us. We look to you this day, O Lord, the Word made flesh, our Savior, who came to dwell in our midst, to save and rescue and deliver us from the darkness and the dark rooms and corners of our lives. Be with us. Shine the light of hope and of your grace into our lives each and every day. And enable us by your spirit to trust in your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we also pray for those who face the darkness of illness and sickness and disease. We pray especially for your servants, Jim Wood, Phyllis Johnson, Bill Check, Tony Snowbrick, Bob Lane, James Scott, Corey Arnes, and all that we name in our hearts. Lord, shine the light of hope into their lives. Bring healing and health and restoration. We also pray, O oh Lord, for all those in the medical industry, 
that as they face many challenges and trials and demands upon them, that you would strengthen them and help them in their tasks and encourage them with the light and the hope that you give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, on this Thanksgiving weekend, we also give thanks to you for the many blessings you grant to us. We ask for your continued blessing upon our nation, freedom for those who are held hostage. But we also ask, Lord, that you would give us hearts filled with gratitude. Help us to focus on the ways that you have blessed us and what we have, rather than on what we do not have. Help us to give thanks even for those future blessings that you will grant to us. Forgiveness, resurrection, eternal life, a new creation, tomorrow's daily bread, your help with next week's challenges. Lord, we give thanks for these things because we know we can trust in your word and your promise to us. Heavenly Father, we will slow down and take a deep breath. There is no need to panic. All things are working for our good and your glory. We know because we have your word and his name is Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We pray the prayer our Lord has given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. John writes his gospel so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. Go forth then in his name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for in his name you have life, abundant life, joyful life, eternal life. May be seated for our closing hymn, again hymn 331, the advent of our King, and we'll sing verses 5 and 6. Mm -hmm. 